So far, when we have been talking about overall heat transfer coefficients, we have talked about geometries which have the same area on one side as they have on the other. But that's not always the case. A simple case where, where that's not true is when you have a circular thing. The area on the inside is smaller than the area on the outside. And for such uh, things, you can define two kinds of overall heat transfer coefficients, one that relate to the inner area and one that relate to the outer area. And it doesn't matter which one you use, as long as you keep track of which one you are using, because you can't use the one that is defined for the inner area and then multiply that with the outer area or vice versa. That simply doesn't make sense. So how do you do that? Uh, well, you can, when you do that, you integrate from one point to another and you get this equation here. And since Q is the same, at steady state, uh, then we can simplify this and we get this equation here. But note that if you use diameter instead of radius, the equation will look slightly different. There is a two that will pop up. So instead of this, you will get this. One thing that you really, really need to know by heart, it should be in the back of your mind is what energy do you need? How do you calculate energy you need? if you heat something up or if you change the aggregation state. If you heat something up, the thing you should be looking for is the heat capacity. If you change the aggregation state, there is an enthalpy of that aggregation change. So there is, for example, an evaporation enthalpy, there is a melting enthalpy. Here you have typical values uh, for some different substances. You don't need to know these by heart, but I think uh, I think an engineer uh, ought to know approximately what the heat capacity is for water and what the evaporation enthalpy is for water. Note, however, that these values are temperature dependent, so they actually change with temperature. And there's one very good reason uh, why evaporation enthalpy changes. And that is that if you heat things up uh, a lot, increase the pressure, there is a point where there is no longer any difference between liquid and gas. That distinction disappears. At that point, the evaporation enthalpy is zero. There is no difference. Liquid and gas are just the same thing. It's just one aggregation state. But at all other, if you go down in, in pressure and temperature, there is a difference, and then you have an evaporation enthalpy. Let's do a simple example. Uh, we have uh, a heat exchanger where uh, we have dry saturated steam at four bar, uh, which is used to heat five kilograms per second of cold water from eight to 37 degrees. How much steam is needed? We will talk about heat exchangers uh, later in the course, but we can actually solve the task without knowing anything about heat exchangers, just looking at the streams and making an energy balance. So steam at four bar, we can look up in the handbook that, uh, that has a condensation temperature at 144 degrees Celsius. And uh, the water should come from 8 degrees to 37 degrees. So we make an energy balance and say that, well, the mass flux of steam times the evaporation enthalpy of the steam, that is the energy that is released when the steam is condensed. That must be the same as the mass flow of water times the heat capacity of water times the temperature change. And we quickly get if you put in all the values, that the mass flux of the steam need to be 0 0.28 kilogram per second. Other things that you need to understand is what you need to know to be able to solve different kinds of questions. So compare these two questions. How long does it take for a frying pan to become hot enough, 175 degrees, if placed on a two kilowatt heater. 
Compare that question with what power is needed to keep the frying pan at 175 degrees Celsius and what will the temperature be on that handle? Now, you don't know the dimensions, but what kind of properties, material properties, you, do you need in these two cases? Stop here and try to figure that out. Okay. In the first case, we have an instationary heat transport. The equation for instationary heat transport can be written like this. Uh, you have an accumulation term, a convection term, and the conduction term, and then a production term. Uh, and you can solve these kind of problems in in Comsa Multiphysics or similar. And they actually do that in Composite Task 4. You do solve time-dependent problems there. Uh, and note that the unit of heat capacities, they change uh, between contexts. So sometimes it's per mole and sometimes it's per kilogram. Uh, and we will typically use joule per kilogram and Kelvin rather than joule per mole and Kelvin. But be careful, it varies between uh, context. If we have a steady state solution, so like in the second question we, where we ask how many watts are needed, not how long time it takes, then the, con the accumulation term disappears. And furthermore, in the frying pan there is no convection, right? The different parts of the, of the frying pan doesn't move around, it's just standing still. And the cooling we get, that can be put into the production term. So we don't need to know the heat capacity. So we do need to know the heat connectivity, uh, but we don't need to know the heat capacity if we have a steady state uh, problem. But in the first problem where we ask how long time does it take, then we need the heat capacity and the heat conductivity. We need both. So the amount of energy that is needed to heat something up, that has to do with the heat capacity, but to keep it at that temperature doesn't have anything to do with heat capacity. I am sometimes sloppy with my, my phrasing of things. Several people have heard me using the phrase energy production. Several colleagues at my department uh, bash me for that because that's you, you can't do that. I mean, you can't produce energy. Energy is indestructible, just like mass is indestructible. Oh, you have the E equals mc squared thing, but uh, okay. Generally, you can talk about energy as indestructible. What I sometimes tease my colleagues with then is to say, do you say your jacket is warm? That is also a false statement usually. It is a true statement if you had your jacket in an oven and then you take it out, then it's, yes, it, it's warm. But what we usually mean with a jacket is warm is that the jacket is a good insulator. So if we are, are going to be strict, then a good insulator is not something that is warm and there is no such thing as heat production or energy production. 